Good evening. It's good to see you tonight. What a beautiful day the Lord has given us, and it's beautiful in here tonight to see all your smiling faces. And uh, as you saw in the video, this coming Sunday night is our worship night. You do not want to miss it. I'm telling you what, we're going to have a great time just spending time in the presence of the Lord, and, and we're going to begin tonight just by spending some time in the presence of the Lord. I invite you to go ahead and stand together. God, we're so thankful tonight that you are here with us, that your presence is with us. Lord, that you are a faithful God, that you are a God that never changes. Lord, we're so thankful tonight that we can trust in you and turn our lives to you and recognize that you are faithful. You are the everlasting God, and we give you all the praise that we can tonight. Lord, from the depths of our heart, from the cry of our heart, we cry out your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready to worship? Let's worship together. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. And strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. And strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord.
Let's put our hands together tonight and give God praise. There's no one like our God. There's no God that compares to our God because our God is greater than any other God. Let's worship Him tonight as we sing, Water You Turned Into Wine. He's a miracle-working God tonight. We praise You, Lord. Water You Turned Into Wine. There's no one like you, none like you, Lord, none like you. Into the darkness you shine, and out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. Come on, church, sing it. Our God is greater. God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God is. There's no God like our God, we praise you Father, and into the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are high. is in this place tonight. Let's sing it. And our God is greater, our God is stronger. Sing it, church. God, you are higher than any other. Yes, Lord. Our God is healer, is awesome in power. Our God, oh, our God. Our God is greater, our God 
is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? There may be some of you that are here tonight and the world may be against you. You may have somebody in your life right now that's just rising up and being one distraction after another and you feel like, why is this happening? You know what? God only knows why it's happening, but he says that he will stand with us no matter what storm we're going through. So be encouraged tonight that if God is with us, what can stand against us? Nothing. We have victory tonight. We have hope tonight. We have purpose tonight because God sits on the throne he conquered death he conquered hell and he is the risen lord and he is the one that we praise tonight amen amen god we thank you tonight that your presence is with us we thank you for your spirit because your spirit is truth god we pray tonight that you speak to our hearts open our hearts that we may become more like you tonight Lord, through the power of your word, whether we're singing it, whether it's the preached word, whether we're reading it, God, let your word, which is truth, penetrate our hearts tonight that we may become more like you. God, we're so thankful for this opportunity to come to this house and worship you and call on your matchless name, the name that is greater than every other name in heaven and earth, the name of Jesus. And we pray tonight in that name, amen. Take a moment, turn and tell someone hello around near, near you. Welcome somebody you haven't met yet. Tell them good evening. We're going to continue to worship together tonight. As you make your way back to your seats, please remain standing. Let's sing together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you full? Trusting in His grace this hour Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of save your side are you washed in the blood of the lamb do you rest each moment in the crucified are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin. 
and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless out and white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the So cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless and white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Aren't you thankful tonight for the blood? Lord, we're so thankful tonight for the blood of Jesus. Lord, the blood that was shed through the death of your son, Lord, so that we could have hope, so that we could have redemption, so we could have forgiveness, so that we could have everlasting life. And Lord, we're left in this world where we want to do everything that we can to be a living example of your goodness and your grace. Lord, we need your help. Lord, we cry out to you tonight. Lord, help us to be more like you. Lord, we want to be holy just like you. We want to be set apart. We sang this song last week, Father. I pray that you just hear the cry of our heart, Lord, as we sing it again tonight. I want to be holy like you, Lord. Let's sing together. I want to be
us for your presence in this place tonight. Can we worship him just a little bit more tonight, church? Let's sing together. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. You are Alpha and Omega. Sing it out. sweet presence in this place tonight. Now speak to us through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Well, can you say amen? amen. It's good to come to church, isn't it? It's good to be together and 
Uh, what a privilege and a joy to be able to worship the Lord. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. We were there last Wednesday, and I want you to go back tonight and go to the 24th chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 24. This is the longest chapter in the book of Genesis, and uh, let's see, it is 67 verses. And so I um, hope you don't have anywhere to be tonight. Amen? 67 verses, Genesis chapter 24. And we're going to uh, just spend a few moments, ask the Lord to uh, speak to us. Hey, let me get a few commercials out of the way, all right? You glad to be here? Okay, if you've not already done so, um, as you leave this evening, go by the display racks, pick up one of these cards. You'll need a magnifying glass to see it, but nonetheless, pick up one of these cards and you'll have it. Amen? And so... uh, I want to just go over a few things with you that we have coming up that we're real excited about. Brother Allen started the service telling you about this coming Sunday night, May the 7th at 6.30, our night of worship. It's going to be a great evening. Make sure you're here for that. Also, May 14th, Mother's Day, and if this is your first Mother's Day with us at MIMS, uh, let me tell you what we've done the past several years. On Mother's Day at 9 a.m., we all meet in the banquet hall, so I want all of you to come. And you say, well, it's, it's not for me. It is for you. It's for everyone. And it's just going to be church-wide. Uh, we're going to recognize mothers, grandmothers. Uh, we're going to just recognize everyone, all right? We're going to have muffins. Would not be muffins with mom without muffins. And amen? Uh, I hear from uh, some good sources that this year the muffins are going to be stepped up. And so we want you to come and get some muffins. We'll have fruit. We'll have all kind of things. I hear Uh, that they're going to have some coffee as well. I mean, everybody went crazy during Easter, and so I was told we have to have uh, this nice coffee for mothers because they just won't settle for anything less or second rate. And so we're going to have, we're going to get you all caffeined up. Amen? Uh, We're going to have photo stations. It's going to be really, really nice. And so you're going to want to make it. Don't, Don't come in late. Don't miss it. Do whatever you have to do. Uh, Dads, let me just call on you to do something. Call your children, your adult children, your grandchildren. Just call them all. Guilt them, shame them, uh, whatever you've got to do. Just let them know if you love Jesus, you'll be here to honor your mom on Mother's Day. Amen? Amen. And so so muffins with mom, it's going to be a great time. Uh, You don't want to miss it. Also, uh, let me just share a couple other things. Youth camp is coming up. If you've not signed your students up for that, make sure you do so. Vacation Bible School, June the uh, 12th, it will begin, and it's going to be a great, great time. It'll be a Monday through a Friday. We need volunteers for games uh, to guide kids to each station, teachers to help. There's a link in our bulletin or on our website uh, where you can go to, and you can go ahead and sign up if you would uh, like to work and would like to be a part. So get to work doing that, and make sure you go through and sign up if you've not already done so, or you can call the church office. We'll try to give you help. Let's move on ahead. You look like you want to keep going with commercials. I've got your attention, so now's the time to tell you. Amen? Uh, What would Father's Day be without Donuts with Dad? And so we're going to have Donuts with Dad, and uh, we may even slip in a little bacon because we men like our bacon. Amen? Uh, We're going to uh, have our Celebrate America this year, but we're going to do it a little differently. Don't panic. Please don't panic. And uh, don't lose yourself over this. But instead of doing uh, both activities on Sunday, we're going to mix it up a little bit. And so on Friday night, June 30th, mark your calendar, we're going to have our outdoor event. We'll begin at 5 o'clock. We've got a lot of food trucks that will be here. We're going to have some wonderful fellowship. You can bring a lawn chair and come on out. We've got games. We've got games for the children, for youth, for all of the older folks. It's just going to be a good night to fellowship and to eat and to be together together. Uh, We'll share the gospel, and then around 9.15, we'll have the what? No, not the fireworks. The greatest fireworks show in Montgomery County. Good night. Come on, people. Amen. The greatest fireworks show in Montgomery County, and you do not want to miss. Then on that Sunday, July the 2nd, in our morning service at 10.30, our Celebrate America uh, time, it's going to be fantastic, and we look forward to it. To that. It's going to be just a good summer. Hard to believe that it's summer. Uh, what is today? The third. Uh, the third. So two weeks from today is our final Wednesday night meal. Three weeks from today is our Awana Awards night. And then we're going to get into the summer. Yes, we're going to mix it up a little this summer. Take a deep breath, slow deep breaths. We're going to do some good stuff this summer. We'll have some church. We'll have some wonderful activities. And uh, we've got some things we'll be presenting to you that we're going to do this summer, and we just look forward to that. Genesis chapter 24, 
Don't worry, I'm not going to read all 67 verses. Instead, we're going to look at the storyline, and we're going to look at a few of these verses, and we're going to just look at what's going on in this chapter, Genesis chapter 24. Pray with me. Father, it is such a joy and a privilege to be in your presence. It's such an honor to come before you and to sing praise to you, and uh, Lord, uh, just to come aside and ask you to speak to us. And so, Lord, tonight, would you reveal your word to us? We love you, we honor you, we worship you, we adore you, and we thank you for your faithfulness and for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said amen. Amen. Well, many, many years ago, uh, I went to college at Liberty University, and I can remember in the early days how the Lord allowed me to start my journey of studying the Bible. And anyone that knows anything about studying the Bible you will never become an expert in the Bible. You will always learn, and the more you learn, the more you will realize you need to learn. And I won't bore you with all of the detail, but I worked at a funeral home as a teenager with my brother, and there was a gentleman who worked there who was a preacher. And for whatever reason, one of his hobbies was to travel around and find garage sales, yard sales, and he loved to get good deals. And one of his most famous slogans was, one man's trash is another's treasure. And he was always coming back and showing us things that he had bought and and just great uh, jewels that he would find. And one day he came in and he had found a cassette tape. This this crowd knows what cassette tapes. I don't have to give disclaimers to us, yes or no. Sunday morning, the teenagers, I've got to give a little explanation. We all know. And so he had found uh, a cassette tape series of what was at that time called the Liberty Home Bible Institute. And so I would get up in the morning and I would go to the funeral home, strange place to study the Bible. But I would go to the funeral home and there was a conference room and I would get into the conference room and I had a cassette player and uh, every lecture was about probably 50 minutes long and I would go through it. And to this day, my favorite Bible teacher is Harold Wilmington and he's in heaven. He, He passed away a couple of years ago. But early on in the early days when Liberty University started, he was one of the first ones, he and Elmer Towns, to go with Jerry Falwell Sr. and to plant that school and to begin that school that has now become the largest Christian school in the world with over 100,000 people enrolled in studying the Bible. And so that, that cut my teeth on studying the Bible. And so if you ever can get any books from Harold Wilmington, Uh, get them. Wilmington's Guide to the Bible is probably one of the greatest uh, books uh, that you can get that'll help complement your Bible study. It's a big green uh, book, and if you get the whole thing, it's about that thick, and uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. And so the reason I'm telling you all of this is what he does is he breaks down the Bible in what's called 12 stages, and he would begin with what was known as the creation stage, and that was the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And he drilled into us again and again and again that if you will ask a man or a woman what they believe about the first 11 chapters of Genesis, it will let you know what they believe about God and it will let you know what they believe about the rest of the Bible. Because in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, it is so foundational that talks about the creation of man, the fall of man, the flood, and the Tower of Babel. And what you and I believe about the creation of man and the fall of man really sets the course and sets the stage for what we believe about all of the Bible and about God himself. I mean, do you really believe that God in the beginning created the heaven and the earth? Uh, Do you believe that he did it in six literal days? Or do you just believe like some who come in and try to impose what's known as theistic evolution upon the creation account and say, well, you know, uh, we can't explain evolution. And uh, and I'm going to tell you this. I have Schofield Bibles. I love the Schofield Bible. I'm not knocking the Schofield Bible. But Schofield was responsible for what's known as theistic evolution and what was known as the gap theory. And so just take it for what it's worth. Don't throw anything at me or get mad. I'm not saying he was an evil person. I'm just telling you that that, that's the way that it was. We're going somewhere. Can y'all take the journey with me? Okay. And so uh, do you really believe God created the heaven and the earth? I mean, these are foundational things. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. By the way, that word heavens in the plural, heavens and the earth. Uh, we could talk about that, but we'll come back another day and talk about that. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters. God said, let there be. God said, let there be. God said, let there be. And so, I mean, God created it. And when you read that creation account, he created in six literal days. He rested on the seventh. And uh, so there are people that just, you know, they want to pick that apart. And when you start questioning that, 
everything else that you believe begins to crumble. Uh, when you start saying silly things like, well, you know, the earth is billions and billions of years old, oh, stop that foolishness. I mean, just stop it. I mean, we're, we're, prove it. Well, you can't prove it. And, and, and so, you know, uh, people just talk about, well, the earth is billions of years old. I mean, it's scientifically proven. It's scientifically nothing because if you get 100 scientists together, they can't agree on that. And they argue about that. So don't come in here. Don't come up in here talking about how that it's a proven fact. It's not a proven fact. And, and so, you know, well, preacher, do you really believe those days were 24-hour days? Well, of course I do. And, and let's just give you one reason why I believe it. When God instituted the law, he said as... God created the heaven and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. You're to do the same thing. So that's where we get the Sabbath from. So if those days weren't real days, but thousands or millions of years, you'd never live long enough to make it to a Sabbath. <laughs> I mean, that's just one, one example. Amen? And so just stop questioning because when you question the Bible, when you put a question mark where God puts a period, everything begins to crumble. And so Dr. Wilmington taught us that in the first 11 chapters, that sets the stage. It's foundational. And what you believe, and I'm just telling you, you mark this down. What a man or a woman believes about the first 11 chapters of Genesis will tell you and scream to you loudly and clearly what they believe about God and what they believe about the rest of the Bible. You see, one of the reasons people have a hard time with miracles is they have a hard time believing God created to begin with. If you can believe God can create, you can believe God can recreate. And a miracle is nothing more than God doing with his creation whatever he chooses to do. If God has the ability to create, he has the ability to recreate. He has the ability to do whatever he wants to. So the first 11 chapters are foundational. That's called the creation stage. Does anyone get that? Yes or no? Well, the second stage is where we are, and it's known as the patriarchal stage, and it's chapters 12 through 50. Don't worry, we're not going to go through the rest of them. We're going to stop there. And the patriarchal stage tells us about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And that's what the real crux of the matter of the book of Genesis is beginning in chapter 12, and we're introduced to Abraham. Do you know uh, we're told in libraries around the world there are more books on Abraham than in any other figure? Because almost every religion uh, acknowledges Abraham uh, in some way or another. Now, you know that is, uh, when it all started, it didn't start as Abraham. It started as Abram. And then along the way, God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. Now, let's just talk about that for a minute. Are you still awake? Amen? So the name Abram meant father of many. What a strange, odd name for a man who had no children. Here he was, no children, not able to have children. God promised him that he was going to have a child. And, uh, you know, here, here he is with his wife, uh, Sarah. Uh, the old timers would say, Sarah. And so Abram and Sarah, and uh, they're 190, and they get a home next to an elementary school because God says you're going to have a child. Amen? And so his name is Father Amini. Do you imagine the people laughed at him? Uh, what's your name? Abram? Oh, Father Amini. How many children do you have? Zero. Ah. And so one day God spoke to him and said, uh, Abram, you're no longer going to be called Abram. Now you're going to be called Abraham. And so can you imagine Abram going to his friends? They're drinking coffee and they're saying, uh, you know, Abram, how are things going for you? Well, it's good, God. God talked to me the other day and he's changed my name. And I can imagine that all of the friends uh, talked to themselves and said, it's about time the old man wised up. I mean, he's 100 years old. He doesn't have any children. Abram, father of many. We can't wait with bated breath or waiting. What's your new name? My new name is Abraham. What? That means father of many nations. I mean, it's gone from bad to worse. So when you study the life of Abram, Abraham, one of the greatest truths is when the Bible says that God uh, speaks to him and Abraham believes God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Uh, Jesus would say, do you remember the Pharisees? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. And they laughed at him. And they said, this man, referring to Jesus, he's not even 50 years old, and yet he claims to have had an encounter with Abraham, our father Abraham, who's long gone. Well, when in the world did Abraham see Jesus? Well, do you remember when he took his son Isaac up to the mountain to offer him as a sacrifice. Does anyone remember this? And many people paint the picture that Isaac was just a little boy. I mean, most of the pictures you'll see in Sunday school uh, that talk about um, 
Isaac being offered on the mountain is a picture of him being a little toddler. And here's Abraham bringing his little baby, carrying his little baby up there, and he's going to offer him as a sacrifice. Uh, Most Bible scholars will tell you that Isaac was probably somewhere around 17, 18, or 19, maybe even a little bit older. And so the beauty of the story is not just that Abraham was willing to obey God, but that Isaac as well was willing to obey God. And so do you remember they take off and God says, I want you to go to a mountain that I'll show you and I want you to offer your son. So he leaves the servants, uh, Abraham and Isaac, and they're going. And he says to them, stay right here. And here's what he says in Genesis 22. I and the lad are going to go and we're going to worship. That's the first time worship, the word worship's ever found in the Bible. I and the lad are going to go and we're going to worship and we're going to come back to you. And Hebrews says that Abraham knew that even if he went through it, God was able to raise him up. So they get up there. Y'all okay? It's in the book. It's a good story, amen? And we haven't even got to the longest chapter in Genesis yet, so hang on. So here's Abraham and Isaac. They're going up to this mountain, and they get up there, and all of a sudden Isaac turns around, and he says, "Uh, Behold the wood, behold the fire. Where's the lamb? And uh, Daddy says to son, My son, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And all of a sudden, as he takes that knife back, do you remember? God says, do him no harm. I know you fear God. And he shows him a ram caught by the horn in the thicket, and he takes it, and he offers it in the sacrifice, and he names the place Jehovah-Jireh. The Lord will provide. And will he ever provide? Yes or no? Sometimes you got to go all the way through, but God will provide. When did Abraham see the Lord's day on the mountain? My son, God will provide himself. And God showed him that day. There's going to come a time when God the Father is going to send his son. Many believe it was on that same mountain that Jesus would die. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God. So real real quickly, how did Abraham get saved? Well, this is what blows so many people's mind. The same way you got saved. And the only difference is Abraham looked forward in the future to the fact that God would send his son, and he believed God. We look back to the fact that it already has happened. There were not two plans of salvation. There's always been, there always will be one, and it's only through the sacrifice of the son. And God showed Abraham a picture on that mount that day that he was going to send his son to be a sacrifice for sin, and Abraham believed God. It was counted to him. That comes, that's where we get the idea of imputation, counted, added to his account for righteousness. God added righteousness to his account, and even though Jesus had not been born of a virgin, Abraham was saved by faith in the Word of God and in the fact that the Son of God would come the same way you and I are saved. So whoever tells you, well, the Jews had one plan of salvation and we have a different one, or the Old Testament, they were saved one way, or the New Testament, throw it out. It's wrong. There's always been one way, only will ever be one way, and it's through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only difference is Abraham and the patriarchs looked forward to the fact he would come. We look back to the fact that he has come. Can anyone say hallelujah, he has come? Amen. Amen. Now, all of that. Uh, Dr. Wilmington got us into the patriarchal stage, and now here we are, and I want to talk about the longest chapter in the book of Genesis, and I'm just getting started. Amen? And when you come to chapter 24, Abraham is now 140 years old, and so, you know, if if we're keeping track, Isaac would probably be around 40, and uh, he's greatly blessed by God. And this chapter is detailing one of the most interesting things in the life of Abraham, but it's as much about Isaac as it is Abraham. And here it is. We're going to tell the story. We're going to lay out the background. Then we're going to talk about what it really means, and then we'll let you out of here. All right? Uh, Abraham's 140. He's greatly blessed by God. And this chapter is detailing his plans to go and find a wife for his son. Now, they just did things a little differently back in those days. And you can't get kids to get on board with this. I mean, you know, back in those days, they arranged things. And I mean, sight unseen, they made deals. And parents get, got together and they, they, boy, the bride would be selected, the dowry would be paid. And uh, you say, well, now, preacher, there's no way in the world I'd marry anyone without seeing them. Well, okay, before you knock this plan, Uh, how's it working for us now? 
And I'm not trying, I can't get my kids to agree to this plan, so I'm not trying, it doesn't keep me from stopping. Can I get an amen? And so chapters 24 through 26, the emphasis upon, is upon Isaac, Abraham's son, and the whole plan that's being laid out for us, for you and for me, watch this, is how Abraham is calling his household servant. Do you remember his name? Eleazar. And he is saying to him, I want you to go and I want you to select a bride and find a bride for my son. And so that's what's going on in this chapter. Abraham's bringing his uh, servant, summons in him, and he said, now I want you to go, and I want you to look for a bride, and then I want you to ask her if she's willing to come, and then I want you to bring her, and I want you to introduce him, uh, her to Isaac. So here's what's going on. Uh, in the life of Isaac, there were several great events. His birth, of course, that was a great event. The one I just told you, chapter 22, him being offered on Mount Moriah, but now the obtaining of a bride. And this details for you and for me how Abraham will send his servant out to select a bride for Isaac. Let's begin uh, verses 1 through 28 by talking about the explanation. And I want to just try to dive into this and give us a little background and some details of what's going on. And uh, if you're interested, let's just call this some tips in searching for a spouse. Can we call it that? So the the explanation, the first 28 verses, verse 1. And uh, Abraham was old and he was well stricken in age and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray you, your hand under my thigh. Now let's just stop. What in the world does that mean? Put your hand under my thigh. Well, who, who, you, you can laugh at this, you can call it crazy, but you know, in our days when we make deals, we what? Shake hands. But back in those days, in the Jewish culture, and it just is what it is, they would shake under the thigh. Brother Michael, I love you. Brother Allen, I love you, but I'm not going to come and shake your thigh. We'll stick with a handshake. And everyone said amen. But, but that's the way they would do it uh, back in those days. And so he would, he would say, Abraham would say to Eleazar, the one that was his household steward or manager, put, I pray you, your hand under my thigh. And I'm going to make you swear. We're going to make an oath by the Lord, the God of heaven. We're going to make an agreement and the God of the earth that you are going to not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but rather you're going to go into my country and to my kindred and you're going to take a wife unto my son Isaac. And, and the servant said, well, what am I going to do if the woman's not willing to follow me into this land? Uh, should I bring your son again to the land? And Abraham said to him, no, beware that you bring not my son with you. The Lord God of heaven that took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and that spake unto me and that swear unto me saying, unto your seed will I give this land. He is going to send his angel before you and you're going to take a wife unto my son from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you're going to, you're going to be clear from this, the oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under his thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning the master. So they, so they laid out the contract. They laid out the agreement. And like we would shake hands, they shook each other's thighs. Grown men. Hello. I'm glad I live in Conroe. Can I get a name? In? And the servant took ten camels. How many camels? Ten of the camels of his master. And he departed for all of the goods of his master were in his hand. He arose, went to Mesopotamia, unto the city of Nahor, and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray that you would send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let it come to pass that the damsel, (laughs) to whom that I will say, let down your pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink, and she will say, drink, and I will give your camels drink also. Let the same be the one that you have appointed for your servant Isaac. So he threw out what we would call today a fleece. You know, I'm asked sometimes, is it wrong to throw out a fleece? And, and, and a fleece, let, what is a fleece? Okay, so in other words, Lord, if this is your will, let this happen. And, and so sometimes we ask for things. I don't think it's wrong to throw out a fleece. I, I just think you need to, for example, be very careful tempting the Lord. You know, let me give an example. Lord, if you want me to eat this bowl of ice cream, let the sun come up in the morning. Well, 
you know, the sun's going to come up. And, amen? Did you hear about the guy who went to Krispy Kreme and he said, Lord, if it's your will for me to have donuts, let that fresh now sign come on? He said, after I made 30 laps around, it finally came on. And so, you know, that's the way we are when we pray. Be very careful if you're going to throw out a fleece, not to try to tempt the Lord, test the Lord, limit the Lord. Uh, can he confirm things that way? Of course he can. But I think a better way is, Lord, speak to me through your word. Amen. But, you know, he's, he's praying. And there's nothing wrong with what he prayed. And as a matter of fact, the Lord answered that prayer. And as a matter of fact, before he was even finished praying, he pray, he, his prayer was answered. So he said, uh, Lord God of my master, I pray, send me good speed this day. Show kindness unto your master. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of men come out. Let it, let it come to pass, verse 14, that the one that I say give me something to drink says, well, wait a minute, not only for you, but I'm going to give water to your camels. And it came to pass, verse 15, before he had even finished speaking, here comes Rebecca. <laughs> verse 16 says, she was very fair to look upon. Can we talk about that? What in the world does that mean? She was good looking. And she was a virgin. You want to talk about that? I, I guess not. <laughs> Neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well. And I, I'm telling you some tips on finding a spouse. You want to hear them or no? Well, I've already got one. Well... <laughs> mm -hmm. neither did any man know her she went down to the well she filled her pitcher she came up the servant ran to meet her and said let me I pray drink a little water of your pitcher and she said drink my lord she hasted let down her pitcher upon her hand she gave him the drink when she had done she said I'm going to go get water for your camels until they have done drinking she hasted empty. so the point is watch this Eleazar he's praying and before he even finishes praying there she is And she's good looking. Amen? I mean, if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly. If you're going to pray, pray big prayers. Right? I always told Luke, I mean, you know, um, and we would always talk, you know, do, does, um, the questions you need to ask yourself, does she love Jesus? Can she love you? Can she cook? Now, that may not be your criteria. It's just a big deal to the Chaddock boys. Amen? <laughs> it's important to us. It may not be important to you. It's important to us. So if you're going to pray, pray big prayers. Hallelujah. Pray for a good-looking chef. Can I get a witness from anyone? Pray big prayers. Well, you have not because you ask not. Well, you wonder why you eat a bologna sandwich every day. Amen. <laughs> So, so what's going on here? The explanation, the story, we're going to get somewhere, but hang in with me. Quickly, here are some tips in searching for a spouse. Write these down. Use them in your life if, if you need one or if you need to help your kids or grandkids. Uh, number one, I believe it'd be good they be saved. Uh, verse three, don't go take a woman from the Canaanites. Verse 11, be a good plan to have someone that's a hard worker. I mean, she's out at the well drawing water. So she's a hard worker. You listening? My aunt had seven kids. I can remember seeing her on her hands and knees scrubbing the tile floor. She was one of the hardest working men, uh, women I ever met. And she would always, we'd always have to sit down when I was a teenager. She would make me eat Fig Newtons, Cheez-Its, and we'd play Skippo. And she would always tell me, and she'd say, now, Jerry, um, this is what she'd tell me. If you don't like this advice, then don't you. I'm telling you what my aunt told me. Amen? I'm bringing you into my world. You do what you want. She said, when you go looking for you a lady, you're either going to have to ask yourself, you know, you're going to get someone that's a beauty queen or a hard worker. Now, you can get both, but you get you a diva, She said, those good looks aren't going to do so good when you wake up in the morning to that bad breath. <laughs> now, hallelujah, I got both. And you can get both. 
But you're going to have to find out, you know, what's the most important thing. Do you want someone with integrity, with character, that loves the Lord, that has a heart to work, is a hard worker? And because I'm going to tell you, when you get those kids and all they want to do is cry and spit up and mess those diapers up, and she's pretty and has to have a spa day, now I'm just going to go ahead and let it all hang out tonight. You got your beauty queen, but you're going to be up all night changing diapers. All right, there you go. Let me calm down. So she, <laughs> they should be saved. They should be, preacher, are you going anywhere with this sermon? If you'll hang on, I promise you we'll try to get somewhere. We're, we're going to fly all around, but we're going to land the plane, all right? So they need to be saved. Uh, they need to be a hard worker. Uh, there, there's nothing wrong with praying for their appearance. Beauty is, uh, they say, in the eye of the beholder, and it's um, not everything, but it, 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 it's important. <laughs> Amen? I should not say this. This, is, this will get me in trouble. There are some preachers that preach it's a sin for women to wear makeup. I think it's a sin for some to not wear makeup. Amen. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Verse, verse, let's keep going. Amen. So are y'all all okay? Amen. We all good? Don't break out in a fight. Let's not have a riot here tonight, all right? Verse 16, she was a virgin. I think it would be good to look for someone that's pure. More importantly, I think the Lord would. Uh, you, you should find someone that's not selfish. Would you give me some water? You know what? Not only will I give you water, but I'm going to give water for your camels. Now, you say, what's the big deal? Well, it would take 30 minutes to draw enough water to give a water, enough water to one camel. And the, he had 10. Now, that's five hours. So you ask me for a drink of water, I give you a drink of water, no big deal. But now I'm going to go the extra mile and say to you, I'm going to spend five hours making sure I give water to your camels, and I don't even know this guy. She was dedicated. She was a hard worker. Amen? She was not selfish. She cared for others. There's no traffic jam on the second mile. You get you someone that, and we could give a lot more stuff, but, but you get you someone my goodness, that saved a hard worker. They're pure. They're not selfish. Uh, you got something. Amen. Amen? You got something. So that's just kind of the story. Who, who's getting the story? Abraham brings Eleazar. He says, I want you to go out and I want you to find a bride. So he goes out and he begins to pray, Lord, let the one that comes to the well, and I ask, give me water. And she says, not only am I going to give you water, but I'm going to give water to your camels. Let her be the one. And wouldn't you know it, while he's praying, he looks up, there she is. She's good looking. She says exactly what he prays for. Takes the words right out of his mouth. And I mean, Eleazar is absolutely excited. Now let's look quickly as we move on. What's really the meaning of this? What's really the interpretation of all of this? Well, when you, you study this, you will discover, watch, that uh, the Lord is telling us about Isaac. And the Lord is telling us about how Abraham is selecting a bride for his son. Uh, verse 32, verse 33, when you read on, and we'll get into it a little more in just a few moments. But when you read it a little later, you will discover that it was extremely important. And the Lord's trying to say something there, but I believe he's trying to say something to us and in a minute when we bring all of this together and get the application and bring the plane in for a land, then I hope you'll see what's going on. When you drop down to verse 58, after Eleazar says to her, my, my master has a son. My master has a whole lot, and he has a son. Will you go and will you be married to him? The Bible says in verse 58, and they called Rebecca and they said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Now, let me just ask a question here. Who in their right mind today, who in their right mind today, any of you ladies, sight unseen? I mean, you don't even get an internet profile pic. You got... A household servant that's come into your community, you've met him, you've given his camel's water, and he tells you about his master back home by the name of Abraham that's got a son named Isaac. You don't have a picture of Isaac. Are you listening? Will you go and will you be married? And she said, I will go. 
So they go back home, talk to the parents, put rings on her fingers. The next day they get up, get on the camel, and they're going back. And all of a sudden when they're going back, Isaac comes running out. She sees him, he sees her. She gets off the camel. She runs to him. They embrace. They get married. And hallelujah. Now, we all say amen, but uh, that's not the way we... <laughs> that's not the way it happened for us. And, and I don't know how many in the room want to go back to all of that, right or not. You say, preacher, what in the world is all of this? I'm, I'm glad you asked. So let's get to the whole heart of the matter and we're done. What's the application of this story? Do you know this is one of the most beautiful stories in all of the Bible because it tells us something. Number one, Abraham is a picture of God the Father. Abraham summons his servant and said, I want you to go select a bride for my son. I want you to know there was a day when God the Father summons God the Holy Spirit and said, I want you to go gather a bride for my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to know, listen, God the Father is the one who planned it. God is the one who planned the church. Abraham is the one who organized and planned this marriage. God the Father is the one who planned the marriage for his son. And there is going to come a day when the trumpet is going to sound, and there is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And every single individual who said yes, 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 Sight unseen, I've never seen him, I've never seen him, but I will pledge my life to him. One day your faith will become sight and you will see him. And Abraham is a picture of God the Father who gathers the Holy Spirit and says, I want you to go and I want you to go to people and say, will you be married to God the Son? Will you be married to God the Son? Will you be married to God? Will you say yes to God the Son? Will you say yes? Do you think it took some faith for Rebecca to say, I'll go? I've never seen him. I don't know anything about Abraham. Don't know anything about his family. Don't know anything about Isaac, but I will go and I will do it and I will be married to him and I will pledge my love to him and I will pledge my devotion to him and I want you to know that is exactly what every single solitary one of us have to do. We have to put faith in God. We have to put faith in his word. We have to put faith in his finished work. You say, preacher, I want a feeling. Preacher, I want some experience. Preacher, I want lightning or thunder. No, no, no. There's the word of God. Jesus Christ has given us his all and we pledge to him. We commit to him. We surrender to him. What a joy it is. You see, back in those days, marriages were a little different. They had a couple of different stages. I mean, there was the betrothal stage, we would call it. And that was the time when the bride was selected, the dowry was paid. That was something of value that was paid. And uh, it was what we would call something similar to an engagement. And what would happen is the man would go to his father's house and he'd build a room. It would typically last around a year, what we would call this betrothal. You remember Joseph and Mary were betrothed. Do you remember that when it was discovered that Mary was with child? And so uh, in the betrothal stage in those days, what would happen is they would select the bride, that they would pay the dowry, something of value, to seal the contract, and then he would go back to father's house and he would build a room, and then all of a sudden there was what was known as the presentation stage, and that's when they were brought together. That's what we would call today the ceremony. And uh, who understands the best part of the wedding ceremony is the cake? Can I get an amen? <laughs> Anytime a couple says, will you do our wedding, tell me about the cake. And if it's a good cake, I'll do the wedding. <laughs> That's not really true, but it sounds good. And then there was what was known as the celebration stage. And it would last sometimes days. There were documented cases of rich people, leaders in those days, rulers that would throw celebration, we'd call that the reception, that would last a year for their kids. Well, I want you to know it all plays out. The bride was selected. The dowry was paid. It was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to purchase us to God. And the bridegroom has gone back to the Father's house to prepare a room for us. And one day the trumpet's going to sound and it's going to be wedding time. And it's going to be the presentation stage when the bride is presented to the Father. And then there's going to be a celebration that's not going to last a few days or a few weeks, but seven years and it's going to be absolutely something else. Does anyone see the parallel? What's the picture? God the Father is being portrayed in the story of Abraham. Well, what's the next picture? Isaac. 
He's a picture of Jesus Christ. Understand this. Isaac, who earlier we saw in chapter 22 was willing to be sacrificed, is willing to submit to the Father, and here he is patiently with the Father waiting on the bride. And I'll have you to know, our bridegroom is waiting. Have you ever heard people say the Lord is tarrying his coming? Can I tell you something? He's not tarrying anything. The Lord knows when he's coming. We just don't know. And I'll have you to know when he's good and ready, he's going to come back. It'll not be one second sooner, one second later. He'll be right on time. He's gone to prepare a room. And boy, what a room it's going to be. Yes or no? And we're going to be caught up together and we're going to be presented to him. You see, we don't talk about this much. I don't know why we don't. But the church is the bride of Christ. And we have been called to be a pure bride. We have been called to be, listen, spotless. And one of the reasons we go through problems and suffering and trials is the Lord purifies us and gets us ready. The Lord's coming back for a pure and spotless bride. And he's going to clean us up. And it's going to be good. Amen? And I want you to hear me that Isaac is a picture and a type of Christ. Well, let's keep going. The servant. Eliezer. Does anyone know what he's a picture of? The Holy Spirit. And hear me very well. What did he do? He went out seeking a bride, speaking of the son, and supplying her needs. As soon as she said yes, Eliezer put rings on her finger. That's a picture of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as soon as we say yes to the pleading of the Lord. Is anyone thankful for the Holy Spirit of God who comes seeking a bride? It is true, no man comes to the Father except the Spirit of God draw them. You don't just wake up one day and say, hey, I think I'll get saved. I want you to know if you have any inclination to be born again, it is because the Holy Spirit is wooing you, drawing you, convicting you, convincing you. Why don't we just have church on Wednesday night? Is that all right? Dealing with us, saying, come, receive my master's son. What a joy. And it is the job of the Holy Spirit to seek the bride, to seek out the bride, and to present the claims, watch this, of the father and of the son to the bride. And does he ever, ever, ever do that for us? What a joy. Eleazar only would seek a bride. He would speak of the son. Man, he told her all about Isaac. I mean, he gave the resume. And don't you know the Holy Spirit does the same for us? The Holy Spirit never speaks of himself. The Holy Spirit always glorifies Jesus. You say, this person's spirit-filled. This church is spirit-filled. This preacher's spirit-filled. Let me just tell you something. If all they do is talk about themselves and they never lift up Jesus, it may be a spirit but not the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself. He will only prompt us to glorify Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit's job to lift up Jesus, and when we're filled with the Spirit, we will lift up Jesus and no one else. Amen? What does the servant do? He seeks out a bride. What does he do? He speaks of the son. What does he do? He supplies her needs. As soon as she says yes, he puts rings on her finger. And then all of a sudden, they get on this camel. And uh, they start going back. Now, I, I, I don't know how much I'd want to ride a camel. I mean, Amen. Abraham's a picture of God the Father. Isaac is a picture of God the Son. Eleazar is a picture of God the Holy Spirit. Lastly, finally, Rebecca is a picture of the church. And this is exactly where we are. Now, let's talk about it. The Bible doesn't say this specifically, but let's just use our imagination for a minute. Rebecca says, okay, I'll go. And so as soon as she says, I'll go, rings her on her finger. She goes and she <laughs> tells her parents and she leaves her parents, right? Right? You're going to be a disciple. You're going to have to put the Lord first. Thank God for parents. I'm going to shut my mouth because it'll happen to me. I, would, I used to say if you parents had your way, your kids would uh, build a tent in your backyard and, and you'd get two cans with a string and, and, and you'd be able to talk and communicate to each other and they'd never, ever leave but I'm not going to say that now. <laughs> so she goes back to her parents. She tells her parents, hey, I'm going to be. What do you think they thought? And so she gets on the camel. Do you see her? And, and so Eleazar, he comes with, man, all kind of stuff. 
I mean, he put rings on her finger, so he obviously had jewels and no telling what else. I mean, Abraham, you, you can like this or not, he was pretty wealthy. And, and whether you like this or not, so is our father. Amen. And so she gets on that camel, and, and, and let me ask you, do you think she probably thought to herself, what in the world have I gotten myself into? Who, who thinks she may have thought that? I mean, dusty, hot, camel. And, and if, I, you know, if I would have been her, you know, a couple hours on that camel, I thought, man, what's this guy look like? What am I getting into? How's he going to treat me? What? Do you think there were times she just thought, could you just stop? And I'm going to get off and go back home. Let me ask you this. Are there ever days you just want to get off and go back home? Are there ever days when things are tough and difficult and you want to quit? You know, we walk by faith, but sometimes, yes or no, our faith gets dim. And it's It's rough. It's dusty, it's dark, it, it's difficult. We don't understand. When are we ever going to get there? Are we there yet? We're worn out, we're tired. Where is the Lord in all of this? I believe in faith, but, but can he just show himself to me? And then all of a sudden, they get there. And out steps Isaac, and their eyes meet. And she gets off that camel and begins to run. He runs to her. And they embrace, and her faith became sight. And the message is this, that Rebecca is a picture of you and me on that camel, riding through the desert, tough times, it's difficult, it's hard, it's lonely, you wonder if you're ever going to make it, you wonder if it's worth it. And don't you come in here on Wednesday night and act all spiritual and say you've never thought about getting off the camel, going home, throwing in the towel, quitting, is it really worth it, am I really going to make it? Everyone, don't raise your hand. I'll admit it for all of us. We've all thought it. I mean, is this thing really worth it? Is this Christianity really worth it? Is it real? Is it real? And all of these difficulties and problems come your way and you just want to quit. But one day, one day you're going to see him. And here's what I know. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It will be worth it all. Amen? Problems, difficulties, setbacks, disease, death, trouble, bad news, horrible news. It will all be worth it when we see him. And when we see the bridegroom, it will be worth it. So stay on that camel. Amen? Don't smoke the camel. Stay on the camel. I'm going to get talked to tonight by my wife for being too silly. I'm sorry. Stay on that camel. Keep going. Trust the Lord. Amen? He's worth it. It's worth it. And what a privilege. What a chapter. What a story. The church was planned by the Father, presented by the Spirit, provided by the Son. Another way to say it is this way, and then we'll pray. The, the Father wrought it. The Spirit taught it. The Son bought it. The devil fought it. The rich man sought it. Praise God, I've got it. Amen? Amen? And um, just uh, stay in the saddle. Keep going. And when you see him, I don't think there'll be anyone that'll say, you know, I regret serving the Lord or I regret saying yes. When you see him, hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Heavenly Father, it is such a privilege to be together in your house tonight and to be able to come before you and to thank you so much for how you love us, how you care for us, and how you meet our every need. Thank you for your people here this evening. Thank you for the privilege and the honor of just spending these moments together in your word. Would you continue to speak to us and reveal yourself to us and have your way. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed for just a moment, for just a moment. Tonight, if you know the Lord and you have put your faith and trust in Him and you know Him as the Lord of your life and you know that you're born again, uh, maybe you would say, Preacher, there's just some tough days, some dark days, some difficult days. You know, listen, one of the reasons, and I really, really do mean this, and I believe this, one of the reasons that we need a church and one of the reasons that we need to be committed to a church and connected to each other 
is because problems are going to come. Difficulties are going to come. I wish as a pastor that there was just something that I could do that would make every one of us immune from heartache and disappointment. And I promise you, if I could, I would. It's going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean we wake up looking for it, but it does mean this, it's going to happen. Count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, the trying of your faith works patience. Count it all joy when, not if, when you fall. That word fall means they suddenly, suddenly creep up on you, and it happens. Everyone in the room could tell stories of how they were going through life and everything was calm and everything was good and then all of a sudden. And being a Christian does not mean that you're immune from problems, but it does mean you have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And wouldn't you like to know everything Eleazar was telling Rebecca on that way back to Abraham, Abraham's house to meet Isaac? And I'm just telling you, it's in those midnight hours, yes or no, in those midnight hours, through the toughest of times, through the darkest of hours, when the Holy Spirit whispers, peace, 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 peace. It is a peace that, what, passeth all understanding. What does that mean? I can't explain it. You can't explain it. You just know when he gives it to you. And he gives you what you need when you need it. And he holds you together. And when the world looks on, and you have every reason in the world to fall apart. He holds you together. That's our God. That's our God. And here's Rebecca, and she's on that camel, and she's going. And Eleazar is speaking and encouraging her. And one day, soon, for all of us just like Rebecca, our faith is going to become sight. And so I want to just encourage you tonight, if you're going through some difficult times, bad times, hard times, hurtful times. The Lord knows, and He loves you, and He cares for you, and He can handle it, and He can see you through it, and He can get you through it, and He can walk you through it, and He can deliver you through it. And you just lean on Him, and you come in close to Him and let Him help you. And so if you know the Lord tonight, just trust Him to get you through each and every moment and chapter of your life and season of your life. But if you don't know him, and if there's never been a time you've trusted him, I'm telling you, listen, just like Rebecca, you can say yes, yes, yes to the Holy Spirit that comes to you and says, will you come and will you put your trust in the Father, Son, the Lord Jesus? He died for you. He gave his life for you. was buried and arose again. Will you trust him? And oh, if you do, what joy it is. Hey, quietly, would you stand to your feet? Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. For just a minute, Brother Allen's just going to sing through a song. If you need to come get at an altar and pray, or if you need to just right where you are, pray about something in your heart, or, or just say thank you, Lord, tonight for being the God of all comfort and love and help. Just do that. Love on the Lord. Thank Him. Praise Him. Come get at an altar and pray. However the Lord's speaking to your heart, we'll just take a minute. We'll sing through one time. Brother Allen's going to sing, we're going to pray. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky and no more tears will dim the eye. By His grace, when 